Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Schreier, professor at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to join this important workshop. Today, you're hearing about a lot of the innovative work being done to further our understanding of the environmental risk factors for pediatric cancers. But in the time we have together, I wanna to provide a brief summary of the definitive data that we currently have linking environmental exposures to pediatric cancers. As you know, or have heard today, childhood cancers as a whole have increased in the United States by about 45% since 1975. This equates to about a 0.8% annual increase in the incidence over that time period. Currently, about 10% of those cancers can be linked to a known inherited genetic predisposition which leads to our growing concern on the contributions of the environment to this increase in incidence. Although exposure to ionizing radiation is an established, established risk factor for some tumors, the risk represents a small proportion for pediatric cancers. The International Agency for Research on Cancer publishes a series of monographs to summarize the existing evidence on carcinogenic exposures to humans. They classify these agents into the four categories that you see here. Today, we're going to summarize the group one agents or those that are carcinogenic to humans with a particular emphasis on what we know in relation to pediatric cancers. These group one agents fall into roughly six categories and we'll step through each um, through the evidence for each of these groups uh, for the rest of our time together. First, we'll start with ionizing radiation. As I mentioned earlier, ionizing radiation is one of the strongest and most well-established environmental risk factors and is known to contribute to leukemia, brain tumors, and certain non-CNS solid tumors in children and adults. As you can see here, radiation exposures have also been associated with many more adult cancers in comparison. Perhaps, but more studies um, have been conducted for these tumors, and that's why we see more evidence in the adult side a theme that we will continue to see in the coming slides with the other agents. If we look among the metals, exposure to environmental metals have been linked to several adult tumors, especially in those organs of entry or elimination for the metals, such as lung, kidney, and bladder. But among children, the metals have been linked to hemological malignancies, neuroblastoma, and certain germ cell tumors. Among the numerous organic compounds that have been examined, again, primarily in relation to adult cancers, only five have been established for pediatric cancer and mostly in the realm of leukemia with one of them also being associated with neuroblastoma. The rest of these organic compounds have not really been fully evaluated for pediatric tumors. As you can see here, most of them have no studies to date being reported. And again, a third slide, mostly no studies to date in the pediatric cancer realm. And even though IARC has not reported established links with diesel engine exhaust in relation to pediatric cancers, our group and others have investigated the role of traffic-related air pollution on pediatric leukemia and CNS tumors specifically. So be on the lookout for more to come in that regard. In relation to herbicides and pesticides, again, the use of these products has been linked to a few adult tumors, um, mostly in the uh, realm of non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, and while many groups have examined the use of these agents and the risk of childhood cancers, the evidence so far has only been conclusive for the use of PCPs in relation to leukemia and lymphoma. Exposures to occupational hazards cause a wide range of cancers in adults. And again, typically with the organ sites involved with entry or elimination of certain compounds. For children, however, having a parent working in specifically the paint industry or doing work with wood or leather dusts seems to increase the risk of leukemia and certain brain tumors. And while welding fumes have been looked at in relation to pediatric cancers, there's no evidence to support an increase in risk for that particular exposure. And very few other occupational exposures have been definitively linked with any of the other pediatric cancers. And if we look again, a couple of pages worth of occupational hazards, um, several groups are still interested in continuing to examine these exposures in relation to other pediatric tumors. Studies um, on these exposures are particularly complicated because they often rely on self-report uh, occupational uh, history from the parents 
Um, and these studies are complicated by international differences and in how job exposures are classified into common job exposure matrices, which are used to evaluate the uh, level of exposure for these uh, types of hazards. Finally, the link of maternal dietary consumption of in nitroso compounds has been linked to the development of CNS tumors in their offspring. This is something we've known for quite a while. And parental consumption of alcohol before or during pregnancy has been linked to leukemia, brain tumors, and neuroblastoma in their offspring. However, other well-established dietary exposures for adult cancers like aflatoxins, which have been linked to liver cancer, have not really been well studied in relation to pediatric cancers. There are a few challenges um, to studying the relationship between environmental exposures and pediatric tumors. Um, I would say they can be categorized or grouped into four main categories. We'll talk about each one of those here uh, a little bit. So um, number one, it's often difficult to estimate exposure during critical periods of development. For instance, is the exposure most relevant for development of a pediatric tumor if it happens to one of the parents in the preconception period? Is it important if it happens while the child is developing in utero, or is it an exposure that's most important, um, a personal exposure for the child during early childhood? Two, many of the uh, associations that we've just uh, talked about have not really been fully evaluated among children and adolescents. A lot of the liter literature supporting these associations, as we have seen, are among adult cancers. Three, investigations to date have relied on self-reported questionnaire data and or on residential information. So uh, there's not a, a good way to measure exposure uh, to these different environmental compounds, especially in the context of children, when again, we don't know what the relevant uh, exposure window uh, is for evaluating the exposures. And fourth, pediatric cancers are much less common, obviously, than adult tumors. And so evaluating the association between these environmental exposures and pediatric cancers often requires large, multi-institutional, and even multinational studies. Even with those challenges, I also see four opportunities that we have in the area of environmental exposures and pediatric cancers. One, we have the opportunity to evaluate these exposures among vulnerable populations. So we know that in particular, minority populations often live in areas where environmental exposures are more common. And so we have the oppor opportunity and really the responsibility to understand these exposures, particularly among these populations. Second, we can utilize novel analytic tools for biomarkers of exposure that can also pinpoint the timing of exposure. So you'll be hearing about that a little bit more from uh, my co-presenters. Third, we have the opportunity to evaluate the interaction of these environmental exposures with what's going on in the genome. Um, and again, uh, being able to look at the evaluation of these measures during the preconception uh, in utero developmental period and early childhood in relation to both inherited and somatic genomes can provide some clues to what's going on uh, with these particular exposures. And lastly, we have the opportunity to evaluate the effects of environmental exposures, not only in the risk of development of pediatric tumors, but for many of these exposures on um, how children and adolescents uh, survive from their cancer or the treatment outcomes that may they may experience. Our group in particular is very interested, uh, for example, in understanding the effects of air pollutants on uh, treatment outcomes and survival for uh, childhood cancer survivors. So thank you today uh, for your time with me. I'm always happy to discuss these ideas um, and look forward to the rest of the discussion for today. Thank you.